In our two previous sessions, we followed the evolution of naming from ancient time through medieval European culture. And now we finally reach the modern time, where we do not translate or adopt names anymore. Now an atomic approach to names reigns supreme. A name is no longer part of the word language in which it occurs. For example, if we take the same French name Jean and look on Russian and other Slavic languages, it will not be Ivan anymore. At its best it will nowadays be Jean, either with Kirill letters, or it might even be Jean, literally reflecting the French original in Latin letters, so as not to miss the peculiarities of the French pronunciation being the source of the nominal phonetic atom that the name now is reduced to be considered as. And the point here is that it emphasizes a change from meaning to phonetics, and moreover to the phonetics of a particular foreign language that produced or handed over the name in question. And by sacrificing not only the meaning of the name, but also the adoption, the name does indeed become just a name. But that does not mean that it is no longer a name, of course, as such, but that it equates to a plain sound devoid of meaning. And when a name is carved out of its natural lingual environment, it seems that the meaning of the name is reduced to, the ident to be an identification of its bearer. Thus the name becomes, becomes identified, it becomes a kind of thing in itself, a linguistic atom, a semantically meaningless sound, and that is the very fate of the name in modern time. But that is not all. The atomism of our time requires that the language itself adopt itself to a name of foreign origin, so that the undefined nuance of its special pronunciation is not lost. And what this, does this radical change in the state of affairs not indicate, if not that the integrality of meaning has been lost? The language forms a picture of the world in the network of which not only the picture casts its shadow on the world, as the later Wittgenstein believed, but in the weaving of which, as Derrida noticed, the spinning out of language, the discursive woof, is rendered and recognizable as a woof and takes the place of a barb. It takes the place of something that has not really preceded it. And the texture is all the more intrusible in that it is wholly signified. 